is it started now? Go ahead, yep. Okay, so like Bill mentioned tonight, we're going to be talking a little bit about Wyoming probate, how it works when it's needed, some possible problems with it, and some ways to possibly avoid it. Now, at the outset, I should be clear that nothing I'm going to be talking about tonight is, amounts to legal advice. You shouldn't rely on it in trying to make your state plan. The goal is just to provide some general information to allow someone to decide whether they should talk to an attorney for their estate planning needs. Um, throughout tonight, um, I'll be using a hypothetical example of a, <clears throat> excuse me, the Melville family, which is made up of a husband, wife, and four kids. Despite being a Wyoming resident, husband is obsessed with the ocean, and he likes to spend his summers away from home searching for whales on his jet ski. That's a somewhat dangerous hobby, so we're going to talk about some things that might happen for his family if they're in the terrible position of having to pick up the pieces after he's no longer around. At the outset, I'll talk a little bit about what the general terms are, because some of these terms can get fairly arcane if you're not familiar with the literature, and sometimes I found I have a tendency to lapse into using these old Latin terms, just assuming that people know what they mean, when a lot of people probably don't. <clears throat> um, first, we'll talk about who is who. Tonight, we'll talk about a decedent. That's the third item on the list. A decedent is just a term for a person who has died. Um, another per person we'll talk about is called a testator, and a testator is simply a person who has signed a will. And the counterpart of a testator for a trust, which is something we'll talk about a little later, is called a settlor. There are a few other types of people we'll talk about who are all fiduciaries. I'll tell you about what it means to be a fiduciary, but the two main groups are personal representatives and trustees. A personal representative is basically a person who's in charge of administering the estate of someone who has died. A trustee, on the other hand, is someone who's in charge of administering a trust, which, again, we'll talk about later. Other people that are important to know about are heirs, distributees, and beneficiaries. These terms all have some specific meanings, but generally if you just recall that they're people that are entitled to receive property under the terms of a will or a trust. So if I die and I have a will that leaves everything to my niece, my niece would be considered a distributee of my will. And then finally, the last category of person that's relevant is the creditor. You probably know what that is. That is just someone that you owe money to. Specifically, in the context of probate, it is someone that the estate owes money to. So, say if I die and I have a big credit card bill, uh, MasterCard would be one of the creditors of my estate. Some other terms we will talk about are estate. I've already been using that term a little bit without explaining what it is. The estate is just all of your property that you own at the time of your death. That includes real property and personal property. Real property is usually called real estate, and that's just land and things attached to it, like houses and crops that haven't yet been harvested. Everything else is considered personal property, so that would include your furniture, your car, and so on. A will is something that you can use to direct how your property will pass after you die, which we'll talk about a little more in a bit. And a trust is a different kind of way of managing property, and I'll save that for later. Other terms you might see include bequest and devise. These terms have specific traditional meanings, but now they pretty much just mean the act of leaving something to someone else after you die. So it's basically like a post-death gift. Uh, you might see the word execution come up. Uh, that's the one that tends to scare my clients during our meetings, but it just refers to the act of signing a will, uh, nothing more gruesome than that. And then finally, sometimes you might see this little uh, description right here where it says WS, then there's a section symbol and a bunch of numbers. That's just a reference to Wyoming statutes. That's just how they're arranged and how they're identified. So if you see that little code, uh, that's just what that means. Traditionally, a lot of uh, a lot of this stuff is a lot of wills and probate are governed by Wyoming law, and we have statutes that cover a lot of that. But there are also some traditional common law concepts that will come into play. <clears throat> 
So what is probate? Probate is just the court process of overseeing the distribution of property after someone dies. Uh, it has a bunch of different stages into it, but you can see what the three main important things are. First is proving that a will that someone signed is valid. Uh, appointing a personal representative, that's the person who's in charge of taking care of the estate and making sure everything gets accomplished correctly. And then lastly, it's just administering the property and making sure it gets to the correct person. Now, Wyoming probate is governed by the Wyoming Probate Code. Uh, you can see where it's located in the Wyoming laws if you actually care to look that up. But Wyoming's probate code is fairly old. It's a mishmash of old California, Iowa, and uniform probate coat laws, and with a little bit of what my boss likes to call home cooking. Um, a lot of other states have adopted what's called the uniform probate code, which generally can make probate quite a bit easier for a lot of people if there isn't a contest about who should be receiving property. Wyoming still has this really old statute, which can be fairly cumbersome if someone's not aware of what they're getting into after they die. So we'll be talking about the Wyoming Probate Code a few times. Um, if you're in a different state, the laws might be completely different. A lot of states have adopted the Uniform Probate Code, which might actually uh, be easier for some people, but um, it's anyone's guess whether Wyoming is going to make any steps towards adopting a more modern, flexible code. We just don't know. So in the meantime, that's why there's a lot of interest in trying to find ways to not go through probate. So when do you have to actually probate something? Now, in order to look at this, like I talked about earlier, we're going to be looking at a hypothetical family. These are the Melvilles. You've got Herman, and you've got his wife, Elizabeth. They've got four children, Mac, Stan, Fran, and Liz. So, unfortunately, while Herman's out jet skiing around looking for whales, he drowns. When he drowns, he leaves uh, several pieces of property, including a house, some silverware, his jet ski, and some bank accounts with some cash in it. Now, the problem that his family faces after he dies is how do they get this property to go where it's supposed to go? It's not exactly obvious if uh, you haven't been trained in Wyoming probate law. There are a few ways that this could go. The first is the easy way, and that's what we call the summary procedure that's available for what we call small estates. You'll see I put small in quotation marks because a small probate estate does not necessarily mean that the person didn't have a lot of money. Wyoming divides property into probate estates and non-probate estates. After you die, anything that's held in your own personal name is generally going to be included in your probate estate. If you have over $200,000 or more in your probate estate, odds are you're going to have to go through probate to get that property to where it needs to go. However, if your property is not worth that much, that could be for a few reasons. First, maybe you just don't have $200,000 in assets. Uh, that's pretty common. If that's the case, then you can use the small probate, uh, the small estate procedure, which isn't really a probate. Or you could have also used certain other alternatives to, you can, um, how should I put this? There are alternative ways of artificially making your probate estate smaller, which we will talk about later, so you can get below that $200,000 threshold, even though you have more money than that. But the way it works out is if you are under that $200,000 level, there's this really simple affidavit procedure where you can just uh, have everyone who's entitled to the property sign this affidavit, uh, present it to a person who has custody of the property, or if there's real property, you might have to file it with the court, but it basically allows you to have the property transferred in a much easier fashion. You don't have to go through the full rigmarole of probate over the course of most of a year or even longer that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So if Elizabeth looked up Herman's property and saw, oh, we're in luck, he didn't have $200,000 worth of stuff, then all she and the kids have to do is sign this affidavit, and it should be fairly easy to get the property transferred to where it needs to go.
Unfortunately, that's not going to be available for all people. If you have a probate estate that is worth more than $200,000 other than encumbrances, you might have to use probate to get that property transferred to Herman's descendants. Now, when I say encumbrances, I'm referring to things like mortgages. So usually it's a house that pushes most average middle class people over the $200,000 threshold because that tends to be the most valuable property that someone owns. Usually that's what pushes you over. But if you're encumbered with, you know, a mortgage, that uh, that can actually push you back down underneath the $200,000. So it's just the equity in your house. So if he had over $200,000 of property held in his sole name, and by sole name I mean it's just he owned it alone, it wasn't a joint tenancy and it wasn't a trust, and it doesn't pass through some other kind of non-probate method, then you're probably going to have to go through probate. And as you can see, it's, there's a good chance that his house might be pushing them over that level. Here you can see a general probate timeline where I've kind of laid out the steps in very general terms. Of course, uh, the specific things that will happen will vary from situation to situation. Uh, for example, in some cases, there might be a contest about whether a will was validly signed. Um, in other cases, there might be disputes between different creditors. So you might have an estate that doesn't have enough money to pay all of its bills, and then uh, creditors might get into a fight about who's entitled to what property based on the, their priority and so on. But generally, if there's a, a simple probate, this is how the process will generally go. Wyoming law says that it's supposed to get done in a little, it's supposed to get done in less than a year, but there can be extensions if necessary. But the basic sequence is first the person who is the personal representative, you'll see that I've abbreviated that as PR, uh, that person will file a petition with the probate court requesting to uh, have the will admitted to probate. Um, and so what the court is, the court will do is the court will, uh, they'll go through the method of proving that the will is valid. Someone can contest whether the will is valid or not. And then if the, the will might nominate a person to be the personal representative, and if not, then the court will have to go through this statutory list to determine who's going to administer the estate. But at some point in time, the court is going to appoint someone to be the personal representative. After that happens, the personal representative swears an oath where they swear that they will, you know, act on behalf of the estate and fulfill all of their legal duties, and then they'll be given what are called letters testamentary. I'll probably talk about these a little bit later, so you should remember what they are, but letters testamentary is just a fancy term for the papers that you get from the court that show that you have the authority as personal representative to act on behalf of the estate. If you don't get those, then a bank isn't going to allow you to, you know, tra allow you to make decisions concerning someone's account. You might not be able to access safety deposit boxes. You might not be able to make sales. Uh, the letters testamentary are the key that allows the personal representative to actually take charge of the estate. And when the personal representative does take charge of the estate, they have a responsibility to collect all the property. They have a responsibility to track down people that owe money to the estate. They need to make sure that the property is in good working order. So, like, say, the person, say a decedent like Herman died while well, he had a house on the market that he was selling, the personal representative might need to act to make sure that, you know, squatters aren't breaking in and that the process uh, for maintaining the property is continued. Um, the personal representative will file an inventory with the court, notifying them of all the property that's been found, and there will be an appraisal indicating how much the property is worth. Lots of notices will have to be sent out by the personal representative. That includes to people that were the natural heirs of the decedent, so like their children. There will also have to be notices to known creditors. So in our example, uh, Herman had quite a bit of credit card debt, um, Diners Club or MasterCard are going to have to be notified of what's going on. And once the notice is provided to the creditor, that provides the creditors with a window of time in which they can file a claim with the estate. 
Now, the way that works is that after the creditor gets their notice, they have a certain amount of time to uh, notify the state of their claim, and then the personal representative has the option of accepting or rejecting every claim. And if the personal representative rejects the claim, then the creditor has a certain amount of time to file a lawsuit against the estate. So after everything has been handled, all the creditors have been properly paid, the personal representative files their final report in accounting with the court, and if the court thinks that everything is the way it's supposed to be, and then they will enter an order allowing the state to finally be distributed to its proper recipients. And then finally, after everything's been taken care of, the personal representative can get discharged. As I mentioned earlier, this is supposed to take less than a year, but this can stretch on for longer than that if you have a complex estate, especially if there are disputes or complexities. One big thing is that if you have a particularly large estate, you have to make sure all of the estate's taxes are paid off before you can make the final distribution. I mean, Uncle Sam and uh, the estate's attorneys are all going to get their cut before uh, Herman's wife and kids are entitled to get uh, whatever he left them. Now, the person who represents the estate, as I mentioned earlier, is called the personal representative. That person can be appointed in two ways. One way is if Herman dies without a will of any kind, then he's considered to have died intestate. Since he didn't leave a will, he doesn't get a say in who gets to administer his estate. So since there's really no indication from him about who's in charge, the court will look to Wyoming law. Now, Wyoming law provides a statutory list of people who are can be appointed to administer an estate. Now, it starts out with, you know, a spouse, then kids, and it keeps going down the priority list until you get to just any interested person who wants to administer the estate. Now, if Herman did sign a will, there's a good chance that he nominated someone to act as his personal representative. A lot of times that will be the spouse, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, in this case, we'll see that Herman did appoint Elizabeth, his spouse, to manage his estate for him. Now, Elizabeth doesn't have to accept that appointment. No one has to be someone's personal representative. Uh, if Before she accepts the appointment, she needs to make sure that she's willing to act on his behalf, make sure that she's willing to comply with all of the requirements of the court, um, and swear to her oath and control the property in a prudent and reasonable manner. If she does ag agree and she signs the oath, then she becomes subject to a bunch of duties. Like we talked about, she has to collect and administer the property. She has to pay his final expenses. She might have to make certain tax decisions. Um, and in the end, she'll have to make sure that the right people get Herman's property. And then, of course, she has to provide mandatory notices to all the people required by Wyoming law. Now, I've thrown this word around a little bit, and I haven't really clearly explained what it is, but a personal representative is considered a fiduciary. Now, what's a fiduciary? A fiduciary is a legal concept that extends to a lot of different types of people. But at its basis, the fiduciary is just a person who has a relationship of trust and uh, care and loyalty towards another person. So, for instance, you might see the director of a corporation being called a fiduciary for the corporation's shareholders. The concept is somewhat similar. The representative is a fiduciary for the estate. Uh, they have an obligation to um, make sure the estate is well maintained and that the testators but um, there are a bunch of additional duties that can come from that. For instance, um, the, f the fiduciary might need to be impartial between different beneficiaries of the estate. So that means if uh, Mr. Melville left all of his property in equal shares to his four children, Elizabeth doesn't get to favor one daughter that she might favor over the others because that's what she wants to do. It's not the personal representative's property, it's the estate's property. So for that reason, Wyoming law creates a legal obligation for her to comply with the law and to d do what um, the will actually requires. She can actually get into civil or criminal trouble if she misappropriates the property for her own benefit. A lot of times, the default rule in Wyoming is that a personal representative might be required to file a bond with the court. 
And this is a pretty good reason to for for someone to sign a will because in your will you can actually waive this requirement and that gets rid of a possible expense that might be not needed for the estate. Of course the personal representative can get that money back at the end, but you know, if there are opportunity costs involved, if you've had to put up the money for a surety bond, you can't be doing other things with it like investing where you might actually be able to get some kind of return. Um, Elizabeth uh, should, it's, if, unless it's like an extremely simple estate, and even then, it's probably a good idea for her to talk to a licensed probate attorney. Um, if she doesn't happen to know any, or she doesn't know anyone who knows someone, then she can actually uh, look up some attorneys on the Wyoming State Bar's website. Uh, you can see I, you can see the address posted there on the website. Um, the bar has what it calls the lawyer referral service where they will point you to lawyers who say that they practice a certain type of law. Now, I do want to make a caveat here that the Wyoming Bar doesn't certify lawyers for any particular kind of specialty, and the fact that they're referring you to someone isn't necessarily an endorsement of that person's um, ability to be a, a great lawyer. It just means that, that person is a licensed attorney who is in good standing with the state bar. Um, but there are other avenues you can look to if you're trying to find someone to help you when you're administering an estate. Uh, one thing I should mention here is that the under Wyoming law, the personal representative of the estate is entitled to a statutory fee, and this is probably one of the reasons that people might not want to use probate to transfer their assets. Uh, usually it winds up to a certain amount of money plus a percentage of the estate, and then the estate's attorney is also going to be entitled to that uh, fee. So those are some possible costs that might come from probate that might be a reason why someone might want to find a way to not have to go through probate. Now, if you die without a will, you're considered to have died intestate. That just means you died and you didn't leave a will. Since you didn't leave a will, the Wyoming courts have to figure out what you probably intended to have done with your property. And to do that, the Wyoming legislature has, in the Wyoming probate code, has provided a list of default rules. This is just what the state decides that you would want since you didn't speak up for yourself. Uh, first, it will provide default rules for who should be appointed personal representative. Um, so first is generally the surviving spouse, then children, parents, siblings, on down the list. Now, if Herman, say, didn't want his wife administering his estate, he probably should have signed a will. Maybe he has a son who's uh, really talented in managing money and making responsible decisions, or a daughter in that same position. Well, if he didn't sign a will, then he doesn't get the ability to, um, to appoint that person. Uh, as we talked about earlier, the personal representative just administers the property under the court supervision. Um, Uh, since there is no will, uh, generally the person who wants to be the personal representative will apply to the court for that authority, and then they might be granted it uh, based on the circumstances. And then the next thing that you need to know if you don't have a will is that the st state also decides who gets your property. Um, it does this based on a default distribution pattern. Now, every once in a while, I've got a potential client who comes up, and they're concerned that if they don't sign a will, the state of Wyoming or the federal government is going to come and take all their property. Well, no, that's, that's not how it works. There, there are some situations where the government can take someone's property after they die, but that's an extremely remote situation. Usually that's when there's literally no one in your line of descent or family that can be available to inherit from you. It happens very rarely and is called uh, esquite is the name of it but that almost never happens, so we're not really going to focus on that. The default distribution, if you don't have a will, is the court will apply Herman's estate in the following order. First, it will pay his, it'll make, it will it'll require his personal representative to pay his final expenses, any creditor claims, and administration fees. Those final expenses include the costs of his funeral and burial, Administration fees will include 
the court costs and include the costs of paying the personal representative and attorney's fees and maybe accounting fees that might come up or appraisal fees during administration of the estate and also the estate's creditors. So you have to pay off his credit card bill. Then after all those people have been paid off, we look to Wyoming statute to see who gets the property next. Now the answer to this question depends on who is still alive after Herman dies. Here you can just basically see what the priorities are. So if someone dies with a surviving spouse and no descendants, the spouse gets everything. That probably seems logical to most people. What might not be so expected is what happens if you have a surviving spouse and descendants, which is what happens here since, as if you'll recall, Herman died with a wife and four children. In that case, his spouse gets half the property and the rest of it is distributed to his descendants per stirpes. Usually when I have people come in a lot and to sign wills, most of them want to leave everything to their spouse. They don't necessarily want to be leaving half their property to their kids right away. The general thought is that whoever the first spouse to die, uh, the, first, the, the first spouse to die leaves everything to the surviving spouse, and then the kids get everything after the surviving spouse dies. Um, but that's not the default rule under Wyoming law. And of course, there are other situations if, you know, there is no surviving spouse. But one thing I should point out here is you'll see that Latin phrase, per stirpes. Per stirpes is just a Latin phrase which explains how property is distributed when certain children passed away. Here, let me explain that to you like this. Here's a chart. So this assumes that Herman died without a will. Uh, since he didn't have a will, Elizabeth gets half this property and his kids uh, split up the remaining half. Now, if all of his children survived him, then each child gets an equal share of that half. So you could see each person gets an eighth share. Now the question comes up, what happens if one of his children died before him? Now, if one of his children died before him and that child didn't have their own children, their property would just get redistributed to the remaining children. However, if that child died and Herman had a grandchild through that child, then those grandchildren are going to be entitled to property that their parent would have received. Now where this gets interesting and where Persterpes comes up is what happens when he has a child who predeceased him who had multiple children of their own. Now as you can see in this diagram, Mac and Stan have both died before Herman. Mac left one child and Stan left two children. The question is that that uh, third generation, who gets one amount of property? Under Wyoming law and under the Persterpes arrangement, each child is only entitled to an equal share of what their parent would have received. So Ahab, since he's an only child, gets the entire one-eighth that Mac would have gotten. But Bart and Ishmael, on the other hand, they have to divide up what Stan would have gotten. And there have been some conflicting data about what people actually want to do when they sign an estate plan. Uh, I think decades ago I saw some literature, I, I don't know, I wasn't alive decades ago, but I was reading some old literature where they found that some people didn't necessarily agree with this arrangement. But there have also been some more recent studies in Iowa where people did say that this is how they wanted their property distributed. Either way, it's kind of difficult to guess since if you haven't signed a will, then you don't really get any say. So here's an alternative arrangement. This is not what would happen by default under Wyoming law, but instead of per stirpes, this is called a per capita distribution at each generation. And in this model, uh, the third generation all split up that, that share that didn't go to the second generation. So this is a lot better for um, the people that have siblings because they get a bigger share. But the end result of this is I'm not trying to convince you that you should do one or the other. The point is that you don't get an option if there isn't a will or trust in place. Wyoming decides by default that if you don't have a will that you wanted a persterpes arrangement. Now, there are a lot of other ways that you might have wanted your property to be distributed. Uh, Herman might have some friends that he wanted to give property to. Um, maybe he wanted Elizabeth to get everything and then have his kids get property after she died.
um, maybe he wanted to use what's called a marital trust, which is a, a little a more technical of an estate planning tool that I'm not going to get into today. But the gist of it is it's a way that spouses can ensure that they um, don't have to pay any estate tax until the second spouse dies. And it's a way of uh, preserving their uh, exemption, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, they also might have some charities they want to benefit. Uh, the basic point is that Wyoming default rules don't provide for any of those options if he died in test date. As I've suggested earlier, uh, wills can be a useful way to control probate. Um, he can make a bunch of decisions. Herman could have said that he didn't want his personal representative to have to file a bond or a surety of any kind. He could have decided who would actually get the property. Um, now, uh, of course, if he did sign a will, he has to have made sure that he signed it according to the proper procedures under Wyoming law, and hopefully he would have talked to an attorney to make sure that the will was properly drafted, um, witnessed, and so on to ease the problem of actually proving that the will is a valid document. Um, if there are disputes over the validity of the will, then there could be, sorry, um, got some stuff mixed up, uh, then, there can, uh, then there might have to, you know, be a fight in court. So some people like to put what are called no contest clauses in their wills. All that does is say that if someone challenges the will and you need to define what you mean by that, then uh, that person gets cut out. Um, there are some problems with those. Uh, they're generally enforceable in Wyoming, but, you know, you have to give someone something in order to have – uh, in order for the stick to mean anything, but that, that's an option if he actually signed the will. Now, Wyoming law says that you can distribute your property how you want by will. Uh, you can say that who you want it to go to, as we talked about earlier. Now, there are a bunch of limits on this. Uh, first, your creditors and um, your administration fees, those are all going to have to take their cut before uh, Herman's will gets to say who gets his property. That includes any taxes that Herman might have owed, any estate taxes. Um, you could see a Ben Affleck from Changing Lanes there where he played a lawyer. Uh, the lawyer is entitled to their share of the estate. Um, you've got your funeral expenses. Um, then after that, all of the creditors are going to want to take their cut as well. And then finally, uh, there's a concept that a lot of states have, and Wyoming does as well, which is called the elective share. To simplify it, the elective share just says that you can't disinherit your spouse completely. Even if Herman is mad at Elizabeth, if he deprives Elizabeth of more than half of the value of his estate after creditor claims and so on, then she can exercise her right to take that half. Now, there is a limitation to that as well, which is that that doesn't count property that's put in trust. And like I keep saying, we'll talk about trusts in a little bit, but that's something to be aware of. As we've seen, probite, probate has a bunch of possible downsides. It's a complex process. It's not designed to be really easy for someone who's living in the 21st century. It's completely public. All the filings in probate are anyone can go down to the courthouse and see what's been filed unless a document's been placed under seal. So everyone gets to know your business. They know how much money you have and who you left everything to. We talked about the statutory fees that are based on a percentage of the estate. Those can go to the personal representative and the lawyer for the estate. Now, uh, people always wonder why a Wyoming still has this really antiquated probate code, and I think this might be kind of a hint as to why things stay the way they do, because we probate attorneys, uh, we can make a killing on these statutory fees if we have to probate in a state that it's worth quite a bit of money. Uh, there are lots of mandatory delays. It just takes longer for the property to get to where it's supposed to go. You have to get court permission to do a lot of things with the property that you might not have to get permission for otherwise. And a lot of people just find it generally intrusive to have a court supervising how their property is distributed. So as we talked about earlier, you only have to probate property if you have more than, more than $200,000 in value in your probate estate. So that raised the question for someone who, say, has a house that has a value of more than $200,000.
is there a way that I can get the value of this house out of my probate estate so my probate estate is worth less than $200,000? Now, there are a few different ways to do that, which we're going to talk about now. Uh, the first one uh, is, our, uh, I guess I just categorize this under survivorship rights. Now, there are a lot of different ways that you can own property with another person. Um, the default way is what's called a tenancy in common. So uh, here you can see Herman and Elizabeth, uh, they own, if they owned their house as tenants in common, for example. If it's a tenancy in common, there is no right of survivorship. And what that means is that when one of the tenants, uh, don't confuse tenant with someone who leases property. That's just a, a term for someone who owns property with someone else. So if, uh, if Herman dies as a tenant in common, his wife isn't necessarily entitled to receive the property after he dies. Instead, that, w that property is going to have to be distributed either through his will or through Wyoming's intestacy statute. And if it's over $200,000, that's going to have to go through probate. Usually when you give property to two or more people that both own at the same time, there's a legal presumption that you intended for them to be treated as tenants in common. However, you can change that. If the property is given to someone expressly as joint tenants, that's the key phrase, joint tenants instead of tenants in common, then the rules are completely different. A joint tenancy creates what is called a right of survivorship. A right of survivorship entitles the surviving joint tenant to automatically take the share of property of a dead joint tenant. So you, as you can see in the example here, when Herman dies, instead of that house, his half share of the house having to go through his will and then go through probate, it automatically just goes to Elizabeth. No need to go through probate. Uh, most of the hassle is gone. All you have to do is uh, file um, file and record an affidavit of survivorship. And so this can actually uh, cut out quite a bit of the difficulty of moving things through probate. Now, um, there are a few other ways to use survivorship. Um, one way that is very similar to the joint tenancy, which you don't see on the slide, but I'll tell you about, is called a tenancy by the entireties. Now, a tenancy by the entireties is... Uh, for, for all practical purposes, it's like a joint tenancy, except it's between a husband and wife. Now, there are some historical reasons in English feudal law for why a tenancy by the entireties is different from a joint tenancy, but all you probably need to know is that um, it's like a joint tenancy between married couples. Usually, the deed needs to say that it's, uh, the, the, it, whether it's a joint tenancy or a tenancy by the entireties, uh, the deed of the property to Herman and Elizabeth when they receive it should say that it's being given to them as tenants by the entireties or joint tenancy. Since they're married, you'd probably want to use the entireties. There's some other reasons for that that I'm not going to go into. Um, other kinds of property that do not go through probate are called transfer on death property. That includes a lot of different things. Uh, for instance, if you have life insurance, and you have a beneficiary on, on that, that prop, those proceeds don't have to go through probate. The same is true if you have beneficiary designation on your 401k, your IRA. These are all really useful ways to pass property to heirs without it being part of the probate estate. A lot of bank accounts and savings accounts, you can, <coughs> excuse me, you can put what, what are called POD or TOD designations. If an account has that kind of designation on it, then the account can automatically be transferred to the successor after someone dies. Again, that property doesn't have to go through probate. That's a pretty easy to accomplish. Most financial institutions will have their own procedures and forms for doing that, which you can just ask about. And then the same can also be done for lots of types of, of securities like stocks and bonds. You, know, you can talk to <coughs> your broker or uh, whoever manages those if you want to do that without having to put your stock in Apple through probate. Now, there's a new way of doing this that's coming up in Wyoming, and that is called, um, we call them transfer on death deeds. Uh, as you can see there, they have a, a longer name, but these will not be possible in Wyoming until July 1st, 2013. 
and this resulted from a statute that Governor Meade signed during the last legislative session. Just to sum it up, a transfer and death deed, unlike a normal deed which has to be effective when you sign it, a transfer and death deed becomes effective after you die. So that can provide a really useful way of transferring property to your kids without going through probate. If you'll recall the joint tenancy example we looked at earlier, joint tenancy was a really good way for Herman to ensure that Elizabeth got the entire house without having to go through probate. But what happens with when Elizabeth dies? Of course, Elizabeth could form a joint tenancy with one of her kids. She could also have what's called a life estate, but that can get kind of cumbersome. The transfer on death deed, uh, which you can do in July, basically just allows it's, the deed doesn't become effective until after you're deceased. And so Wyoming law has a statutory form that you can actually look to to ensure that the property passes. And again, that property does not have to go through probate. A really very easy way of transferring your property without the expense of probate and one that might make a lot more sense to people that aren't in the market for trusts. That is the next topic. What are trusts? A revocable trust is a really popular way of transferring property without having to go through probate. Uh, trust is a concept that we get from Old English law uh, from the Middle Ages. Uh, it came about during the time of Henry VIII when nobles were trying to find ways to pass property without Henry getting his cut. What you should probably know about trusts is that it's a way of dividing up ownership of property. Uh, let me explain like this. Um, the law considers property rights not as a single thing, but as like a bundle of sticks. So if I own a house, my ownership is like, you know, a bundle of twigs where each aspect of my ownership is considered one twig. There's my right to make decisions about the house, such as whether to sell it. That's one twig. There's my right to enjoy and use the house and, you know, sleep in it at night. And that's another twig. What I'm getting at is that two of the main ways that property ownership can be divided is into legal and equitable ownership, legal and beneficial ownership. Uh, legal ownership, legal title, is the right to make decisions about the property, the person who actually owns it. Beneficial ownership is the person who has the right to actually enjoy it. Now, what a trust does is it divides those two forms of ownership. In a trust, someone who's called a trustee has legal title to the property, but they own it on behalf of a beneficiary who's entitled to beneficial enjoyment of the property. Now, uh, this can the actual distinctions here can actually get really complicated because there are lots of different kinds of trusts. Um, the person who creates a trust is called a settler, and the settler can has a lot of flexibility in what rights they want the trustee or the beneficiary to have. Now, a revocable trust is a special kind of trust where the settler retains the power to revoke or amend the trust. Revocable trusts are what we're usually talking about when someone is using a trust as a will alternative. So in a, the basic idea is that um, when you create a revocable trust, the settler will transfer the property to a trustee for a beneficiary's benefit. But the catch is that the settler, beneficiary, and trustee can all be the same person. Now, this might seem a little strange, but this is how trusts are able to avoid probate. The idea is that you transfer the property to the trust, and then since a trust doesn't die, once you die, there's no need for the property to go through probate. Instead, the successor trustee will take over and can then distribute the property as is required by the terms of the trust. So here's a, an illustration of what a trust structure would look like. So um, Herman creates a trust during his life. And then during his life, um, he will be the initial trustee. So that means he gets to keep managing the property as if it were his own, other than the fact that there's this legal technicality that he's the trustee of his trust. So he'll transfer the property to his trust while he's alive. So he'll execute a deed to his house, giving it to himself as trustee. 
Then after Herman dies, he will have executed what is called a pour-over will. You know what the pour-over will does? It just says that if there's any property that Herman happened to own in his own name at the time he died, it's automatically sent over to the trust. What this does is it allows all the property to be held in the trust when Herman dies. At that point in time, the property will be governed by the trust document, and it can do uh, basically what Herman wanted it to do. All that property doesn't have to go through probate. It saves a lot of costs, and it uh, ensures a lot more privacy, and just a lot more flexibility in how the property is actually managed. Um, uh, yeah, as I explained, usually he'll transfer it to himself as trustee. Uh, the trust should be revocable. That's because if it's like a will, you're going to want to be able to change it because life circumstances change. You don't want to be having an irrevocable trust uh, determining how most of your property will pass. Uh, generally, a will isn't strictly necessary if all of your property is passing through trust, but it can still be useful, so that's why we usually advise clients to sign a will anyway. First, it allows you to appoint a personal representative. Wills have other uses. Uh, you can use them to nominate guardians for minor children. Uh, as we talked about, you might want a pour-over will to catch any property that you didn't transfer to the trust while you're alive. Um, sometimes we get people that will, they'll find out that their Aunt Mary inherited a bunch of oil interests in North Dakota that she never knew about while she was alive, and now we have to go back and probate all of that property in order to get it where it needs to go. If there were a pour-over will, that might be able to catch that property and automatically put it back into the trust, defeating the need for an actual probate. Uh, other benefits of trusts, they're completely private unless there is an actual lawsuit about the trust. Um, there's no need to file it anywhere or show it to a court or let anyone know what you're doing with your property. That's why every once in a while you'll see like a, a big story about how a celebrity died and they left all, they disinherited their spouse and didn't leave anything to them. Well, usually if you actually look at the will, you'll see that the will left everything to a trust and then no one in the press knows what the trust said. So really, we don't know what that person did with their property. Uh, trusts are really useful for lifetime management of the property. Um, since Herman is the trustee of his own trust, he can manage it just as he would as if it weren't his whole name. He can amend the trust if he wants to. He can revoke it. He can sell the property. He has uh, power over it. Uh, the other nice thing about the trust is that a lot of times, like, say Herman got conked on the head and became incompetent so he couldn't manage his affairs during the late years of his life. Normally, in that situation, his family might need to go to court to be appointed conservators or guardians. That can be another uh, burdensome process with lots of court oversight. It can be expensive. And, frankly, it can be embarrassing for people that, you know, don't want – all their stuff out in the open about how they can't manage their affairs. If Herman had transferred all of his property to a trust instead, there really isn't a need, there might not be a need for a conservator to be appointed because the successor trustee, say his wife or one of his kids, can take over and manage the property after he can't do it for himself without having to establish an expensive, cumbersome custodianship. Um, trust can also be useful for uh, giving property to others, Say Herman's kids are minors when he dies. If the property is left in trust, then that can ensure that it's safeguarded and protected until they're old enough to manage it for themselves. Um, that's another side benefit of trust for other people. Now, if you create a trust for yourself, obviously it's not going to get very much protection from your creditors. That would be a really easy way to uh, fraudulently divert your property to keep MasterCard from collecting on their debts. However, if he non-fraudulently creates a trust for another person, say his uh, daughter, as long as that property is held in trust, if it has the proper provisions, then daughter might actually be protected from her creditors as long as it's held in trust. So that's an added benefit that more applies when you're thinking about what happens to the property after you're dead.
Revocable trusts will generally have no tax effects. Um, it's a re it's a revocable trust is is disregarded for federal income tax purposes. That means it's not a separate person. Um, you just report all of the trust income on your own 1040. The trust also won't have any uh, a revocable trust won't have any estate or gift tax effects. If you're interested in gift or estate tax planning, you're probably going to need a more complicated trust. And the last benefit is trusts allow you to pick and choose uh, what law you want to apply. If you die in Wyoming, um, your property is going to have to be probated according to whatever Wyoming law says. You might not like it here. However, with a trust, you can set up a trust in any state in the U.S. That's why you've got lots of people flocking to uh, favorable jurisdictions like Delaware to create trusts. Um, as a side note, Wyoming has actually um, been ranked uh, quite well in recent years as being a really good place to locate trusts just because of how favorable our laws are. But trusts are not for everyone. Uh, I'll bet you if you go talk to an attorney tomorrow and you talk about wills and trusts, a basic will plan is going to be quite a bit cheaper than a trust plan. Trusts are just more complicated to create. And so the basic trade-off is, do you want to spend more now in creating the trusts, or do you want your heirs to have to spend more when they have to probate your state after you're gone? Now, some people don't care. They say, hey, I'll let my kids take care of it. It's their problem. But, of course, at the same time, a lot of people might not be at risk of having to go through probate with their property. If you don't think you're going to have $200,000, then you might not need to worry about avoiding probate. And as we've talked about, there might be a lot of cheaper alternative ways to avoid having to go through probate. You could, for example, use those transfer on death deeds or joint tenancies or tenancy by the entirety. Um, we have all these. There are other ways of keeping your property from having to go through probate that might be simpler for someone to accomplish than actually getting a whole uh, trust plan with all the bells and whistles. Now, there's some other possible issues with trusts. They might be more cumbersome. Uh, some banks, uh, banks have gotten actually pretty good at uh, being able to title property and trusts because they're just so common now. Ever since the 1970s, when there was a big craze for people trying to avoid probate, uh, trusts have been fairly common. Uh, there might be some issues with due on sale clauses if you're transferring property that has a mortgage on it to a trust. Generally, a good rule of thumb is just to be in contact with your financial institution to I, to make sure everything's on the up and up. I've, I've, I have personally, and I don't think anyone in my firm has ever heard of a, a bank actually exercising one of those clauses because property was transferred to a trust. And then I guess the last thing I'll leave you with is that um, drafting wills and trusts is the practice of law. Now, you can clearly do this for yourself, but... There can be lots of problems with, with doing that. I mean, there are lots of kits out there, but the kit doesn't necessarily know what your interests are or what your circumstances are. Uh, there are also lots of complexities that can lead to undesirable consequences if someone who doesn't know very much about estate planning tries to draft it on their own. I mean, we see a lot of that. People come in and here's a home-brewed trust that, where the person didn't know what they're doing and it ended up costing their heirs a lot of money and legal fees to fix the document just because they didn't want to hire an attorney in the first place. And then the flip side of that is if someone is drafting wills and trusts for someone else and that person is not a lawyer, that is actually illegal under Wyoming law, so that's something to be careful about. Uh, usually the most prudent task is just to contact an attorney who's licensed in the estate. Um, you should make sure you've got all of your information before you go and talk to them all of your property, all of your debts, all of your family members. Um, it's a confidential relationship, so if you provide them with everything you have, then they can actually create a plan that's tailor fit for you and what you actually need. And so, you know, not everyone needs to worry about avoiding probate. Um, honestly, the fears might be a little overblown, especially with some of these new things that are out there, but it's something that's good to know about, and it if you don't talk to an attorney, uh, you might not actually know um, what your options are and what the most prudent course is for getting your money to your heirs. And I think that's about all I've got.
All right. Thank you, Aaron. We appreciate that very much. That was an excellent job. And uh, we're, I'm going to ask uh, those of you that are still on, if you haven't indicated so, if you would put in the chat box where you heard about this program, we would appreciate it. Uh, we're going to be taking a summer break and probably picking up with a new series in September, so watch for the advertisements. Uh, we did record this program, and as I have stated earlier, it will be on our website, which is www.uwyo.edu slash ces slash money. I'll put that in the chat box one more time. And with that, I think we're finished. If you have a quick question for um Aaron, you can type it in the chat box, and we'll stick around a little bit and try and give you some answers. Which affidavit are you talking about, Michael? If you're talking about the the small estate affidavit, there isn't really a legal form for that. The statute just lays out what the requirements are, so that's something you might need to talk to a lawyer about. Any other questions? Aaron, I, I work with folks that tell me that they've put their children's names on their um, accounts in an attempt to make sure that their bills and things are going to be paid or the kids will have the money when they're dead. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a caveat or something that they need to do with a, as far as being an owner versus a signer on an account? Well, yeah, after uh, being a signer isn't necessarily enough. Uh, after someone dies, if you need to pay the estate's bills, then... Um, an account's going to have to be opened up in the name of the estate, and that property is going to have to be segregated from the person's own property. So I guess that might be one of the big caveats. But that can be a useful way of ensuring that the property is still available after someone's died, so you know you can make those payments that are needed. They just uh, need to be kept track of. Anyone else? All right. Well, then, we thank you, Aaron. I have another question. Oh, okay. where, is the, where is the probate court? Is it um, the same court in every, every county? Uh, yeah, the district court in every county sits as a probate court. So the district court in Laramie County, uh, Laramie County. So, yeah, that's just um, some states have their own special courts. They're designated that way. But here it's just our, our general courts, which are the district courts. Anything else? All right. Well, thanks again, Aaron. We appreciate it, and have a good evening. All right. Thank you.